Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. Ever heard of the idea that life on Earth came from outer space? More specifically, the idea that the basic elemental chemical building blocks of life wound up on this planet after a long journey through outer space after the Big Bang? Well, that idea has a name, and that's called panspermia. And that's the topic for today's episode. We're talking today about panspermia, the name given to the idea that life on Earth came from outer space. Now the term panspermia comes from two Greek words, pan, which means all, and sperma, which means seed. Panspermia is actually sort of a catch-all term though. It's used to describe any scientific theory that has life as we know it on Earth beginning somewhere by some mechanism in outer space. Other related terms that are to some extent interchangeable, or at least strongly related, would be exogenesis, which suggests that life on Earth originated, genesis, outside, exo, the Earth, in outer space. The scientific community utilizes the term astrobiology and also exobiology as well. Again, these are all sort of terms that are part of the matrix of the discussion of how life got here, ultimately from outer space. Astrobiology and exobiology describe the potential study of extraterrestrial life, technically speaking. Now, we have to talk about potential study of extraterrestrial life because to date there's no proof of extraterrestrial life out there even in microbial form just yet. So scientists in this field currently deal with microscopic ele elements that could have produced life. When you hear panspermia talked about in the popular press this is really what they're talking about. Don't be misled into thinking at this point that we have life discovered in outer space. It's just the building blocks. But since we have those building blocks, scientists like to talk about, well, if the building blocks are out there in space and Earth shares those building blocks, maybe life on Earth came from outer space, hence the whole discussion of panspermia. Panspermia theory actually comes in two variations. First is called cosmic ancestry. Now this is the idea, or the assertion anyway, that life has always existed everywhere in the universe. In this view, life was not transported to Earth. It didn't come from anywhere particular in space. Life's components were originated via the Big Bang. And so consequently, the newly formed Earth already had the necessary microbial building blocks for life, like countless other celestial bodies in the universe. Life was everywhere. The second perspective or the second variation of this is more common and that's the idea that the earth at one time did not have life or the building blocks for life and so the ingredients for life came from elsewhere in space. So the basic difference between the two views is that the earth got the elements for life at the very beginning of its formation, that's cosmic ancestry, versus those elements, those building blocks, found their way to Earth much later. Now that second variation, the idea that Earth got its microbial life elements long after the Big Bang, and after the Earth was formed, raises the important question of how living microbes from space came to Earth. There's two options here as well. You have undirected or non-intelligent panspermia, versus directed or intelligent panspermia. The meanings are to some degree self-explanatory. For undirected panspermia, again, non-intelligent panspermia, this presumes that microbial life seeded the earth randomly, apart from any sort of intelligent direction. In other words, apart from any intelligent divine creator or apart from any intelligent extraterrestrial. There's no intelligent causation with undirected or non-intelligent panspermia. 
The other option, directed panspermia, proposes the opposite, that a non-earthly intelligence, divine or alien, intentionally seeded Earth with life. It's a creative act. It brought on, um, maybe it was brought on ships or spoken into existence, something like that. But some non-earthly intelligence brought life to be. Now we're talking about the how of panspermia, the mechanism. If you take the directed or the intelligent panspermia view, this is easy. In theory, at least, you can either say, well, God did that, or intelligent extraterrestrials did that. Maybe they put uh, alien life or microbial life on ships and shot it to some other world. I mean, you at least in principle have a working catalyst, a working mechanism. But if you're of the random, undirected panspermia variety, you can't rely on those sorts of mechanisms. How do undirected or non-intelligent panspermia theorists explain how microbial life wound up on Earth and survived the journey through space after the Big Bang? Now, several mechanisms have been proposed by this school of thought. You could have a meteor or an asteroid impact, again, carrying the building blocks of life from one place to the other in space, something called radiation pressure, other scientists have proposed the so-called red rain phenomenon of Kerala, India. The most famous example of some sort of mechanism, or at least a potential argument for a mechanism, although it's not conclusive, was the meteor ALH84001, discovered in 1984 in Antarctica. ALH, by the way, stands for Alan Hills, who discovered this particular meteor. Now this meteor is thought to have come from Mars, and you probably have seen a number of photographs of it or things that have been found on it. ALH 84001 gained media attention in 1996 when a group of scientists claimed to have found microscopic fossil bacteria in it. Now those claims have been rejected by the wider scientific community. The unusual features in the media can be explained in ways that do not require once living bacteria. The more recent red rain phenomenon from Kerala, India has also not been accepted by the majority of astrobiologists as proof of extraterrestrial microbial life. The issue here, of course, is the striking red color of the rainwater. The red color is due to microscopic red particles that looked like that's the key, looked like biological cells. In actuality, there's no similarity though. This is not a case of biology. What made them stand out was not only sort of the way they looked, but they were different than the usual suspects that you'd get in such a specimen, desert dust. Conventional atmospheric transport processes like dust storms could not explain their presence because they knew they weren't dealing with dust particles, and they thought, again, just because of certain aspects of the appearance, they had biological cells. Some suggested the particles were from a meteor burst, and there we have the meteor element coming in again, hence the relevance to panspermia. Unfortunately, a study commissioned by the government of India concluded that the rains had been colored by airborne spores from a known terrestrial algae. So the Kerala rain, the red rain, uh, made fit quite famous on the internet as being a catalyst, an answer to undirected panspermia. That is not the case. That has also failed scientific testing. Let's go back to directed panspermia. I mean, typically this idea, again, directed intelligent panspermia that life was seeded here by aliens is the stuff of science fiction. There are very few credentialed scientists who believe this idea. And that's understandable since we have no scientific evidence yet that shows we are not alone in the universe. And you sort of need that for directed panspermia. You, you need to be sure that you have aliens first. But there have been exceptions, and a famous one at that. The idea that intelligent aliens seeded life on Earth was first seriously put forth in 1973 by Nobel Prize winner Dr. Francis Crick, along with Dr. Leslie Orgel of the Salk Institute. Now Crick, of course, won a Nobel Prize with James Watson for discovering the DNA double helix. Crick and Orgel suggested that the seeds of life may have been purposely dispersed by an advanced extraterrestrial civilization, possibly by means of spacecraft. 
Crick further posited that small grains containing DNA may have been fired randomly by extraterrestrials throughout space for later colonization. Now, interestingly enough, Crick and Orgel were intellectually driven to consider this possibility due to their pessimism that random evolution could account for the complexity of DNA. Complexity, of course, uh, is an argument for intelligent design, the ID movement. And all they're really doing is, let's put an S on the word designer and say it's designers, extraterrestrials. There are creationists, not young earthers, but in the scientific community, in the intelligent design community, who entertain panspermia as part of God's creative activity. Those people do exist. One such proponent is Robert B. Sheldon, a NASA physicist and proponent of intelligent design. This shows that intelligent design arguments really could be usurped and stolen by those who favor an alien creator or alien creators. So, is panspermia a viable idea? It actually depends on a few things. First, is there evidence for microbial life in space, just generally? And second, is there evidence that microbial life from space made its way to Earth? Third, is there any way to know with certainty that the primordial life on Earth from which more advanced life forms are thought to have evolved could not have been based on Earth all along? Now, science has produced no proof for any of these essential items. Even if it does, it wouldn't rule out a designer. You have theists like Jews, Christians, or Muslims who accept evolution, they would be fine with an undirected panspermia. The real challenge would be directed panspermia. But how would we know that? Just take the word of an extraterrestrial? Just assume they're not lying? It assumes greater technology means greater ethics. And again, that's just an assumption. It is what it is. It would be even difficult to know if the claim was made by an extraterrestrial who sort of showed up and settled the question of whether we're alone or not. We would still have to trust them. We are the apex of technology here. Has it made us more ethical? I mean, just think about that question. We assume, again, that greater technology means greater ethics but we really can't make that assumption on any coherent basis if we just look at ourselves. We are, as I just said, the height of technology here, and we certainly have problems with truth-telling. There are lots of evidence to the contrary about whether we could be trusted or an intelligent being could be trusted just because they're intelligent. So panspermia has some fundamental problems in its way. It's an interesting idea, it's one that I'm you know, sort of personally fascinated by. But again, to be honest, and we try to be honest here, we just don't have the evidence to draw any conclusion about whether it's valid or not. Thanks for watching Fringe Pop 321. Please visit our website for source data and resources about this episode and of course others. And come back and watch more because what you know may not be so.